Ooh, now I'm all sweaty because that's stressful. <laughs> oh, hi. Still too low. Oh, okay. <gasps> what you got? Hi, welcome to Fiber Love Diary. I'm Trisha if we haven't met, and if we have met, welcome back. Luther's probably gonna drop a golf ball on the hardwood floor any second. So, just telling ya. Oh, we <laughs> still got it. This is my life. Here's Gus. We're gonna talk about Gus today. It's been a while since I did a Q&A. You guys had a lot of questions lately, and I actually, because I'm dumb, printed these out before the studio tour video came and then I added some handwritten ones on the back from that and we had another one on Sunday at the Fiber Tribe little crafting group we do on Sundays at 2 p.m. my time. Time change this Sunday, don't forget, I won't be here though. Let me tell you that first. This coming Sunday, which is November 7, I think, yeah, 7. I will not be there. We do an early Thanksgiving for all of our kids so that they can come and then be free on the actual Thanksgiving day to go to their spouse's parents, their other parent, you know, all that stuff. So we do it early. We call it Clark's Giving. That's my last name, if you guys don't know. I don't know if everyone even knows that, but my last name is Clark. T today I'm gonna do some spinning. I am actually filming it, but let me show you what I'm gonna spin. So this is some BFL that I dyed and I sold the first braid and I loved it so much I was like, I think I need to do that again for myself. We're gonna go through these and please feel free to always ask me questions, send me questions on Instagram. I get questions in messages, in emails, and I've been trying this time to get everyone's name, but if you email it to me, I'm not always sure if you want it to be public, so then I don't put the names on, if that makes sense. But this is what we're spinning. I've already spun the first half, so after this is done, I'll get to ply it, which I'm excited about. And it is BFL Silk. Oh goodness, it's all over the place. It's BFL Silk, I know someone will ask. And it's that stuff that's like taupe to begin with. It's natural colored BFL, at least that's what it says. Yeah, I don't, I never named this colorway because it didn't even make it into a label before it was sold. Which is great and I love that. That makes me feel so special when you guys are like, I need that, don't even bother to put it in your shop. <laughs> it happens sometimes, right? It is actually Tuesday morning. I had to refilm because I didn't like any of the footage the first time I did this. It was real not good. <laughs> So here we are. We're in my living room. That's the answer to one of the questions. And then put on my reading glasses. I just thought I'd film in here today because I have a window right here so I get natural light. I didn't I don't have to mess with lighting when I film in here. But also sometimes it's fun to change it up, right? Can you see my loom? That's my rigid loom <laughs> back there. So what are you guys up to? Or if you have questions that you'd like answered in the next one, please start putting them in the comments. I love it. I mean, 2021 has been a crazy year, right? It's just been, to me, not as crazy as 2020, but everybody feels a little different, it seems. All right, I have my questions ready. I am gonna kind of like go backwards. So let's do this thing. Okay, Diane Tallman Fiber Fan asked, what Carter do you have? So I have two Carters and I have a Dream Carter. I have a Brother Extra Large Motorized Drum Carter, which I love. And it makes huge, huge bats, which is probably my favorite thing about it. Um, and then I have a Strouch Finest Drum Carter. And I am not sure, I've seen some rumblings that Strouch is no longer making Carters. I don't know if that's true or not. But I will say that I think it is just like such a good Carter. It is still too tight on the tension. It is such a good Carter. I just absolutely love it and think it is great. And I will never let it go. My dream Carter, I would really like a Pat Green Super Card. They're like $4,000. And I brother owns Pat Green's um, 
plans, Carter plans now, and like the Pat Green name and everything. And I am a brother dealer, so I hope someday I'll have one, but I'm, right now it's not in the card. So, but I want one. I want one bad. Okay, Patty Feeler asked, would you be willing to do a basic dyeing for beginners video, explaining exactly what you do at each step and why? I've watched so many and you only talk about bits and pieces. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I'd love a basic step-by-step. -step. So that is actually happening. My guess is it'll be here very, very early in 2022. Yes, there is actually a plan for 2022, which is weird because I've never done anything with a plan. Like it's just not normally how I do things. I just, whatever, but a lot of you have been asking for classes. I put a question up in the Facebook group a while back, like if I was gonna do a class or if you had the opportunity to take a class with me, what would you ask for? And you guys answered with some great, great answers, great class ideas. Classes are coming next year, real classes. So that she did say at the end, you just have a casual relaxed way of explaining things, so I'd rather get it from you than someone who will talk about pH, etc. So I'm going to mention pH, but what the context of that will be that your water pH is your water pH and you should work with it, not against it. Um, I'm not gonna talk about testing it, I'm not gonna, none of those things, but you kind of just need to learn to like work with your pH the way it is because trying to change your pH just to dye stuff at home is cumbersome it's way too whatever and in my opinion it isn't even necessary that's an opinion so you know we don't all think the same and that's okay that's what makes the world go round Chris T said oh good you mentioned the Angelina type fibers you say you buy what you like the looks of where do you buy them at festivals or online I pretty much buy them all online I'm sure I see them at festivals, but I buy them online. I, if I need a color specifically, well, I bought a big color sampler that gave me like a whole, whole bunch of different colors like a couple of years ago. And you know, a tiny amount will just last forever. I usually just like buy a sampler and then pick a color that'll work for me. I never just buy one color. It's just not. I just don't do it that way. I'll buy like a set because you can get a better deal if you do it that way. Carolyn Davis said, was busy all day, so I'm watching this tonight and weaving. Okay, so that was a live. Um, what would be an easy sweater to make for a first? And thank you for the, all the inspiration. Love you. Love you too, Carolyn. That's a great question, which I love. I knit my first sweater in like 1998 probably. So I don't know if I have a good recommendation, but, I, but I'm gonna leave this to everybody that watches. What do you think is a great first sweater, an easier sweater to start with? There are a lot, there are so many, and you know, I don't even know where to begin. Who put your favorite first sweater in the comments for Carolyn and help her out because there's just so many and, and I don't know your style is part of it. So um, I would recommend that you go on Ravelry and use the advanced search and you can put in like your difficulty level, um, what type of yarn you wanna use, all those things and it'll give you suggestions. And then you can find one that's your style, but I, you could put in the easy, difficulty level and then go from there that way you can find something that's exactly your style fits yarn you already have in your stash if that's how you want to go all those things and also i bet you're gonna get some amazing suggestions from the comments thank you carolyn okay becky schrader how hard is a double warp what are the do's and don'ts i cannot imagine but i'm willing to try but wondering what is the difference between a double warp and using a double weft or using eight four yarn instead of eight two. Okay, so visual aid time. This is an oversimplification, but if I go way deep into like the weights, those numbers at the beginning, I think that's just like a lot. So, but let me kind of like boil it down. So if you have two strands of eight two or oh, try, I'll just do my best to approximate or one strand of eight four, this is basically what you're you're looking at the difference. The two next to each other with the 8-2 with their diameters next to each other creates like a flatter 
surface and the 8.4 is like gonna just be a bigger rounder surface so it you can totally do it it's not wrong many people like it better that way no reason why you can't do it that way if that's how you like it but i like that flatter surface of the two lying next to each other better that's just me <sighs> you it says how hard is a double warp it's really really easy actually because what she's talking about is the dish towels um you can also find something that's called a double warp where you warp you basically warp your loom to do two thicknesses just like I did in the purse video or whatever you want to call it where I wove a tube that's also called a double warp but when I'm in the dish towel videos and that is what this comment was on I am actually referring to just two strands for every warp end so like on a rigid head of loom which is what this video was about I put two strands through every hole, two strands through every slot, which means one full loop. Because when you pull the loop through, you've got the strand going out and the strand coming back. So that's how you do it. And I, I like those for a couple different reasons, but one of the reasons I really like to do that is because I really like to use odd numbers in my designs. And if you use odd numbers when you're warping a rigid heddle loom, you can't just warp a whole loop. You have to just do one end and then tie it at the other or three ends. You always end up tying at the other end of your warp. And I don't want to do that. I only want to tie on one end. So if I use a, a full loop, I can do three full loops or I can do five full loops instead of doing loops and then having a half a loop so that's the reason why i do it in the warp you don't have to you can really do it however you want to do it you don't have to do it the way that i do but i promise you if i do something i have a reason in my designs in design in general i like odd numbers a lot of the time i can't explain why but it's like a design characteristic that's kind of well known that odd numbers are more pleasing to the eye. But I do like it because it creates symmetry in the weave. I don't, this is how weird I am. You guys, the, what's going on in my head is stressful. You don't want to know too much. <laughs> but that is part of the reason. Um, I don't know, what else can I tell you? Okay, Robin Foster asked, and I love this question. Um, have you ever used or heard of a weaver's rapid warp loom or has anyone keep thinking about getting one in the future watch your YouTube watched YouTube videos of them being warped and they look much easier okay I've never seen one in person I have seen them on YouTube I agree it looks so easy to warp I have showed John I was like look at this and he's like oh my gosh that's so cool here's the thing that keeps me from buying one and has kept me from buying one for probably four or five years, four years, um, when I first learned about them. So if you've never seen one, this is hard to explain, but it's like a, a big flat loom. But it's kind of like a rigid head of loom, it's sort of. And you warp it, you literally warp it by starting the thread and then flipping around this big, unless I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Robin, if I'm thinking of the wrong thing, please do correct me in the comments. You just keep like rolling the loom in the thread. So you just smooth the thread down as you roll the loom. So it's really neat. And then the way that it changes the shed is you, you roll this, I don't know what that thing would be called, but it, this thing has like bumps and grooves and it raises and drops the threads as you roll this apparatus in the middle look it up so I showed John when I first found it and I was like okay isn't this cool and it is totally cool but we were talking about it and I don't think you could weave more than the length of the loom at the top and the bottom because you're making a big loop so that's what has stopped me from buying one is that I feel that even if it is easier, it, it does seem like it's easy to warp, but if I have to do it like five times more often, because I do really long warps on my rigid heddle loom sometimes, 
So if I have to do it five times more often, I still didn't want to do it. And also I thought I'd have a lot of waste because I'd have to warp it over and over again so often. But it is a pretty neat idea. I wish there was a way to like, what's the word? I wish there was a way to translate it to a longer warp and then I would be totally in it, girl. But Melissa Shermerhorn asked, how do you set up your e-spinner so you don't have to stop and move the slider all the time? Your bobbins seem to fill evenly all by themselves as you spin. I use a woolly winder and so a woolly winder works by a little gear that's turning at the top of the bobbin and um, as you spin and that gear is turning, there's a hook that moves back and forth along the bobbin and just changes where it's filling as you go up and down. So it fills it evenly without me doing anything and I love that. I don't have one for all my wheels. I have a jumbo one for my Ashford, which I like. And it's really, really nice if you are plying because you'd never have to change a hook. You can just go and go and go and go, especially if you're doing a really fine ply and it's just gonna take forever. It's just nice to like not have that extra step to, to keep changing it. But also your popping always looks so pretty that way and you don't overfill it, you know, in one area and make it, um, what's the word? I guess unbalanced isn't quite the right word, but you know what I'm saying. So I love it. They're expensive and the bobbins are also quite pricey because there's like, um, they're, they're special. Let's put it that way. But that's how I do it. I, I do really like it. And for the Hanson, I mean, the best thing about the Hanson, I think is because it's motorized, it'll just go the same you can just kind of like hang out and you never you can go really really fast and not ever have to stop it so it's really nice roxanne richardson asked what is a bump so a traditionally a bump would be a 10 kilo um like twisted thing of prepared fiber where it's about 22 pounds that's usually the context that I'm using if I talk about a bump because I buy wholesale bumps for my shop that way. But um, sometimes in the US you find them to be different sizes, but it has kind of like many terms been sort of changed to mean um, smaller quantities that are just wrapped in that same little shape. Now it's just more used to refer to that shape of that wound. It's almost like a yarn ball well, the way that they wind those yarn balls, but it's roving. And so it's used a lot now to refer to the shape and not that particular weight. Like loop cells, bumps that are um, wound like that, that's what it means. Um, Susie Q said, I love llama yarn. I have never tried spinning it. I think your be beagle wants to be up on the sofa with you and Luther. I don't remember hearing your beagle's name before. What is it? So that's Gus. He is snuggled up to one of his favorite blankies right now, right over here. And Gus probably did want to get up with us, but let me tell you the story because it, it will make more sense because you always see Luther and he, Gus is only recently wanting to be like around me all the time. We've had him for seven years. We got him in, I think it was May. And um, he has had, fairly frequent ear infections almost his whole life. We thought he was allergic to gluten. And I mean, we've fed him special food. I've cooked all of his food. We've given him antihistamines. We've given him like everything. We've done almost everything we can think of to try and curb the ear infections because I feel like you just can't let them suffer that way. And they will kind of try to hide it. Animals mostly try to hide if they're not feeling 100% because of predators. So um, we've literally tried everything that we can think of. I've tried tons of things from like the internet and stuff that seem to make sense about, you know, bacteria, diet, fauna, flora, all that stuff. And, um, we have had to put meds in his ears many times, give him oral meds. Every time he takes oral meds, he gets like a bad yeast infection because it kills off all of his gut fauna. And then he's just sicker than a dog and he's got 
like itchy patches it's just awful it's been so awful for him and he was at a point where he really didn't want to be around me or john if we came around he would leave because we were making him miserable. We were constantly trying to fix those ears and make him better, but he doesn't know that. He just knows we're messing with a sore, you know, ear. This is probably gonna take forever, I'm sorry. So um, last summer, we took him to a new vet because when we moved, I couldn't get to the vet that I wanted to go to, and I didn't like the vet that we could get into, so I went to a different vet. I found one that other people had recommended in the area. Um, it still wasn't my first choice, but you know, I'm like a mommy trying to find the perfect pediatrician for her babies, and that is me. <laughs> I'm sure you guys won't be surprised by that. And with COVID, all the vets were trying to get caught up and nobody wanted to take new patients. But we found one and he had a bad ear infection. We went through two or three treatments of the stuff that you put in and you leave for a couple weeks and then you come back and have them check it for the bacteria. And after all those rounds of that, um, it still wasn't gone so they sent a sample to either michigan state or u of m i think it was u of m they have a dbm program and they sent a sample of the bacteria of what was going on in his ears and they it came back to be an extremely um antibiotic resistant bacteria that humans can also get infections from we haven't so it's nothing like that but um so they formulated a special antibiotic for him at the university and we got it back and we used it and he's better. And he's just now over the past like two months starting to act like he loves us and we're his pack again and like he's still okay. He still feels better. So. I mean, he was always like our little sweetheart, snuggle bug, and for the longest time, he was just miserable. I feel awful about it, especially for John, because Gus used to climb up in the chair and like just snuggle him, and he wouldn't do it anymore. He didn't, if you even tried to like pet him on the head, he would just leave. And it seemed even like he was scared of us, so it, it was awful. But Gus is back to being my sweetheart. You can tell he's so super excited to be here. <sighs> oh, okay. I would love to join in making socks, but my knitting is awful and it stresses me out big time. Can you recommend a super easy sock pattern for me? There are a whole bunch. Go on Ravelry or go on um, Google and just Google vanilla sock pattern and that's what kind of what you want. That will just be like a plain sock very easy um there's a lot of different toes and heels so i personally think a heel flap vanilla sock is a good one to start with but it, any vanilla sock is probably going to be very easy and fine to start with and there's a bunch called vanilla because vanilla just means like basic i really think for your first pair of socks it makes a lot of sense to knit a worsted pair because you'll be done with the first one so quickly and you can get onto the second one and just sort of reinforces how the construction works and the truth is once you understand how the construction works it doesn't matter so much about what size yarn or how big your stitches are because the construction works in the same way i usually suggest that people make for their first pair either a very small pair of socks or a normal size pair of socks with a really thick yarn worsted or bulky something like that so try to look for one that you can do with worsted for the first pair okay peace love and rico asked can you dye ginned lint cotton can you dye ginned cotton lint slash fibers you can dye cotton it's a different kind of dye from what i use i have dyed plant fibers before which it's the same process so um it's called fiber reactive dye and you use it and usually you what you want to do is leave it to sit wet for as long as you can stand to leave it sit wet. So you use a different fixative, you use a different kind of dye, but yes, you can dye them. It won't 
generally, I can't think of a time when your cotton would come out of clear water the way it will of wool if you've exhausted your dye. It just doesn't work that way. So um, that's one thing you always have to rinse it a ton. That's one of the reasons why I don't really dye cotton, but I have done it before. Um, I've dyed some that I wanted to use for dish towels. I just haven't ever done it. I haven't woven with it yet, but someday you'll get to see it. Okay, Kate was talking about the charka, Kate Gundla, or Gundla, and she said, don't you need two hands to spin? It looks too fussy. Uh, many people spin long draw with just one hand. I don't because I like to control, well, I like to control the speed the twist goes in, but I also like to draft against it with my backhand. So I don't, but many people do. So yeah, you can spin one-handed. I mean, all the people pretty much that use a charka spin one-handed, so it can be done. Chris T wrote, about John's tight sock, what about as you get farther towards the area of his ankle, increasing the diameter of the needle that you're using, even to the point where step one for a couple of rows and then start a larger needle so for a couple of rows and then reduce back to the original needle size. I've done this before. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Thank you so much, Christy, for mentioning that. I was gonna add stitches and instead I did do this. I went up two needle sizes. One thing I've noticed is that when I do this in color work, I cannot really even notice it if I, even if I'm looking for where I transitioned. So I went, I normally knit socks on a zero cause I'm a loose knitter and I went up to a, I guess it's called a 1.5. And I um, I knit the socks, he put them on, uh, well he put the first sock on yesterday and then he got his foot in it, no problem. So that problem is solved. Thank you so much for suggesting it though because I really didn't think of it. I have not used that um, method in a couple of years and I just really appreciate you reminding me of it. I'm just going to sew, so where can we find the pattern for the sweater you made for John? It is an interweave pattern. You can find it on Ravelry or you can find it on Interweave's website. It's called the Whiskey Creek Cardigan. And it's also in the, there's a link in the description box for that video. That was the finished project um, update that I did pretty recently. Tracy said, the yarn you spun for your sweater, is it two ply or three? She's referring to the light blue yarn, light blue and gray yarn that I um, finished up in that same video. It is a three ply. It's a traditional three ply until I got to like the last half a bobbin and then I could not be bothered to go ahead and um, separate it so that I could do a traditional three ply. So I chain plied what was left on the last bobbin. My thought was it's gonna look a tiny bit different. It won't be very noticeable, but I'll use it for the ribbing around like the wrists and stuff because that the ribbing is gonna break up the way that the yarn flows anyway. And the colors will all be the same. Nobody will really notice. I'll, I probably will notice, but I don't think anyone else will. Okay. Vivian said, will the pattern be for the rigid heddle loom or the floor loom, is there a conversion system for drafts between the two styles of loom? For, it will be very, very easy to convert. Their threading pattern looks basically the same and it's plain weave. I'll be giving instructions on like how I do the length and all those things so it will be very easy to convert. I will actually probably include like heddle size for both because they won't be the same. They won't be identical, they'll be very close. You'll be able to convert it. There will be a little bit of information for each type of loom. Fran in Virginia had a question about the Dorset Horn video, the first sock extravaganza video. She asked, how warm was the dryer? I have mine set on medium. Um, that's just like what I normally do our laundry on. I don't switch it to high unless I'm doing like our comforters and stuff because that takes forever if I don't. It was on medium and that's my normal setting. I wanted it to be what I would use normally if I was washing just our regular family laundry. Lori Kula asked, how much roving did it take to get your 2000 yards of yarn for your sweater? I had 20 ounces and I actually have like 2100 yards. Um, Hen and Chicks Fiber Arts asked, what shop are your items in? My sister and I do yarn quest. Woo so you must be in West Michigan. 
stuff is in Knit and Spin in Montague, Michigan. It's just a little teeny cute, adorable shop. We have the nicest, like best community of people um, that come in and it is just, it's a wonderful place to be. And um, it's only like three and a half miles from my house, which is also very crazy and wonderful. And I saw on your Instagram that you got there and that you bought a braid. I hope you love it. Um, I, I absolutely love that place. It's really fun. Okay, Pat Bain asked, <laughs> actually Pat and Cindy both asked questions about my manicure. Um, acrylic gel, what is it? What color nail polish are you wearing? So I use mostly the Beatles gel polish. I do it myself. It is not perfect, although usually you can't tell that it's not I mean you're not seeing it close enough that you can see the issues but it isn't perfect and the color they don't name their colors so the color was a 77 it's like a red transparent glitter polish <clears throat> and you guys know me I was like putting it on and I'm like this is not enough glitter <laughs> I do know how to put it on like the little cosmetic sponge to get more glitter but I wasn't sure how that would work with the like translucent color so I just let it be what it's gonna be right now I have like a pumpkin spice thing going but I won't be able to keep it it's it's growing out almost time for it to go away I did not get the name on this one but it says maybe next time next thing we do sock wise could be testing I think this was crystal um some blending to get the perfect sock yarn I probably won't, but you definitely should. And let me tell you why I probably won't do that is that all of us are looking for something different in a perfect sock yarn. So my perfect isn't your perfect. And if I tell you it's perfect and you're like, well, that is not what I value in a sock yarn, you know, it's not gonna come out perfect for you. But I would really suggest that you do that because wouldn't that be great to know you had like a go-to for the sock yarn that you absolutely love, you can buy it anytime and make socks you love out of it that'll do what you want them to do? It's, you should do it. <laughs> we should all do it. Annette said, how did it feel after knitting the yarn up with the higher microns? So what I have noticed about higher microns is that they don't always feel coarse. It kind of depends on the way that they're spun sometimes. So if you spin them to be smoother, you'll get less prickles. I'm not saying you'll get no prickles, but you'll get less pricklies out of it. But let's see if I can say this and it'll make sense. Because each fiber is less fine, it's less apt to just like settle and, and smoosh down and it's going to more want to spring up and it can spring up because it's coarser and it has more body to each strand. So it's a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times it just resists going into shapes a little bit more. So it won't be as drapey. It will be squishier because it'll be tending to spring back to its original hair shape, if you will. That's how I feel. I don't mind them at all. Some people can't stand them. It's really, that is a very personal thing, how much prickle or how much of a coarser fiber you like or don't like. I really like a rustic fiber, especially for socks, so it's fine for me. I didn't get the name for this either. I assume washing and warm could make a difference. Hopefully someone will tell us. Is the Dorset a coarser yarn like Suffolk? Appreciate the WPI wraps per inch info and yardage too. Washing and warm might make a difference. The reason I washed in cold is because that's how I do our normal laundry. There's a couple different reasons. It takes a lot of energy to heat the water and I'm trying to save the planet, you know, all by myself like a dummy. And a lot of detergents are formulated for cold now. So everything gets clean and cold. And also the warmer the water is for a lot of fabrics, especially cotton, the faster you will fade the color. I don't use warm for anything but whites. So I washed exactly the way I normally would wash a colored load. And since our socks are gonna generally be colored, I that's what I use. Also, the way the felting works and the finer the fiber is, the easier it felts. Generally, again, not always the case, but the way it works is that every piece of wool has like cuticle on it just like your hair and when you put them in hot water the wool 
or warm water, some of the cuticles will raise and the temperature's a little bit different for every type of wool. So warmer water may make a difference. And then what happens is, and the reason I said in the first video that I needed to make sure there was more friction than just those two swatches going around in my washing machine is that once the cuticle is lifted around the hair shaft and the, the strands of yarn are rubbing together and all those hair strands are rubbing together, they're interlocking. And then when they cool down, the more the whole time it's hot they're interlocking like that in the dryer if they're in hot water whatever once they cool down once they hit cold water um they will basically like slam shut they'll slam back down to the hair shaft and whatever they've interlocked with grabbed on other hair shafts of cuticles however they've interlocked they slam down and then they grip each other and that's how it shrinks and how it felts that's why if you've ever pulled something that you accidentally felted and tried to pull it back into shape you'll actually hear them like snapping apart because you're actually breaking hairs as they pull apart from each other and that is why it could make a difference if you washed it in warm or hot water uh, again I wanted to do it exactly how I would treat it in a load of our regular laundry so that's how I did it it's soft enough this is again for the dorset horn is it soft enough for over your shoulder or needs to be over another layer of clothing um, I probably put it over another layer of clothing I don't mind it on my feet but I think on my shoulder I would want something under it. Is Dorset the same as Dorset Horn? I bought a fleece that was labeled as Dorset. You'll have to contact the shepherd. The thing is people don't always know or they don't always label it so you'll have to contact your shepherd. It could be or it could be Dorset Down. I don't know for sure. Okay, Duana asks lots of information. Love this and has been my goal to make sock yarn not there yet. Question one, is it better to use double drive? I have single drive. Is it better to dye after spinning? Okay, I have talked about this before, but it's been a while. I don't really believe that the drive alone makes a difference, really. So I would say no. Um, different wheels could be better or worse, but I really believe, and I, this might, touch someone's hot buttons I don't know but take it from someone me who has double drives I learned on a double drive but I also have had a multi a couple of different single drive wheels and I do not believe there is any difference in how you can use every wheel what I believe the difference is that people don't a lot of times really learn how to adjust the other type of wheel that they're not used to as finely as they're used to adjusting the wheel that they've gotten used to and really practiced with and it's become almost instinctive over time so i believe they can both be adjusted to do almost anything so but it does take practice and it is like a completely different animal when you switch from one to the other you really just have to teach yourself how to do it so that was one question. Oh, is it better to die after spinning? It isn't better. It's gonna be a different result. I decided early on, and I don't think I ever mentioned it, that I was gonna do two where I dyed them as yarn and two where I dyed them as the top or roving before I spun it. So the next two will be dyed prior to spinning just to kind of show you know, how it comes out differently. Up to you guys. It, it just comes out differently and honestly there are like a million techniques for dyeing roving or top there's a million techniques for dyeing yarn so it's just really about how you want your finished socks or finished yarn to look i have a methodology question i totally get testing for washability what about testing for walkability having worked too many socks from sock yarn that washed and dried well but ended up with me having to darn the heels balls and heels in less than a year also we got to see other pupper and what is this cast on the cast on is the twisted german cast on yeah also known as the norwegian cast on it is one of my favorites for socks it's very very stretchy i i really like it for socks so that's the cast on i know it's nice to see you got to see gus in that one suzanne bryant did a fabulous test of regular and superwash wool where she washed watches many 
times and the results were quite interesting uh yeah we're not doing i'm not comparing to superwash in any way because superwash is completely different my goal for this was so that i would not i could try to get away from superwash permanently there's other things i don't like about superwash i don't like the way it grows i don't i just there's a lot of things that it just doesn't work for me and also I don't do things that other people do I'm kind of go trying to go my own way in the world and that's great but I'm not going that way so testing for walkability I believe that's not something that someone else can test for you I almost never wear out a pair of socks John occasionally wears out a pair generally it's on the heels for him I can't believe I'm saying this but I knit so many pairs of socks that I'm thankful when they wear out because that means I get to knit another pair of socks so that's not a priority to me if you're if you have different priorities you should do your own tests there's not really a good way for me to test that anyway that's truly got any science to it at all because I don't know how you wear your socks. I don't know how, like, do you wear them in shoes? Do you wear them in slippers? Do you just wear them around the house? I don't know anything about how you size your socks, which makes a big difference. So I can't really test that with any sort of reliability at all. Um, you know, you can just do your own testing. I'm not really, everyone's methods different. And the truth is I talked about science, but I can't really use scientific ways because I don't have a way to create, to create, to control every variable, which is part of scientific testing. I don't really have the ability to do that in this situation. I'm not trying to test every possible variable. I'm trying to test for one that's going to be a go-to for me for long term and that means I have to test the ways that I use them, the concerns that I have, the important factors to me. And I also put together those kits so that if you have your own priorities, like I would encourage you to test them however makes sense to you. I knit so many socks. I gave away 15 pairs of socks to a friend who doesn't knit socks but lives in New Mexico and really wanted some. And I was excited because it meant part of my drawer was empty and I could knit a bunch more socks. Okay, so we're down to the last few questions on the studio tour video. Deborah Cherry asked, where are the looms and wheels? Basically, she was like, hey, where are you stashing your looms and wheels? It's a great question, Deborah, and I love it. Uh, many of you guys have seen in our living room, that's why we're actually part of the reason we're in here. In our living room, we actually have a little spinning wheel garage right outside your view here. And then there's one down at the end next to this cupboard by our fireplace. They light up. John is an engineer and he really appreciates that spinning wheels are like a really pretty tool. And so he built them, those spinning wheel garages on our fireplace two wheels in there and then the rest of the wheels actually get stashed in these cabinets because they either fold down small or they're electric or whatever and then the minstrel is still in a box and not put together so that's in a closet and that's where all the wheels are except the one I'm using right now which is the matchless and my looms are actually in here too and the reason is because when I'm weaving, I don't want to necessarily be like stuck down in my studio, not that I'm stuck in there, but I want to hang out with John and maybe I want to weave in front of the fireplace or whatever in the winter. And my knitting is very portable. I can take that to any part of the house, but the looms are more challenging to move. They're not impossible, but they're more challenging. So they just live here. There is room in this room and I can just like tuck them in a corner and then get them out when I'm using them. So that's where those are. Diane Evans asked, what do you consider a sweater quantity? Um, for me, a sweater quantity is generally gonna be over a pound, and it kind of also depends on how much yardage I got out of it, but sort of in, as a generalization, it's more than a pound. <laughs> Many of you commented on the size of my wool stash. You didn't actually see the raw fleece closet. So that's probably just as well. That's actually in, um, we have a closet under the stairs in our bedroom and that is like full up to my armpits of raw, not raw, washed fleeces that I bought raw. My stash is enormous, but I spin almost every day. That's no joke. I make so much yarn every year, you would not believe it. Yes, it's enormous, but I've been spinning for 14 years and I have stuff that is literally from the first wool purchase that I ever made when I bought my first wheel. I got a bunch of wool with it. I still have some of that. So yeah, 
it's big but I spin a lot. Penny said, how in the heck did you survive without this room? Penny, I don't know. How did I? There was stuff all over this house tucked into closets and corners and cupboards. When we moved here, there is a wall, I think it's a 14 foot wall in our dining area that was completely empty and a bare wall with no windows or anything. So when we were moving here, John got a thousand square feet outbuilding that came with the property. And I was like, look, okay, you're getting all this space for your hobbies and I don't begrudge you this space, but I need some place to store all my stuff. And so he put in, well, kind of together, we put in pantry cupboards along the whole 14 foot wall that are, I think 24 inches deep. I'm really good at using every little bit of space and um, I did. And, but I mean, in, to his credit, he was, he put all that in for me. There's like everything there. There's a plug in the back of one that has an extension cord that if I wanted to use machines or my computer or whatever while I was crafting in the kitchen, I could pull that whole thing out with a plug strip and I would have all the plugs that I needed. I mean, he set it up so I could use that for everything. But as this business grew and this channel grew, my spinning and my stash and everything grew, you know, I just needed more space. And especially as we became empty nesters, the space kind of has changed in the way that we need to use it and the way that we can use it. I'm thrilled to have it, but I, I've always been really good at just figuring out how to use the space I have. Okay, last question, and it's not really a question. Carrie thanked me for leaving the mess. You know, I have many times talked about this. I don't believe in perpetuating the myth that anybody needs to be perfect to be great. And um, I mean, I'm not saying I'm great. I am a recovering perfectionist. So for me, it takes some of like the shame away to let you guys see that I'm not perfect and I mess up all the time. I have noticed that some people feel really like good about pointing things out that I don't do their way or don't do perfectly. I don't see that as imperfections. I see that as people that are more rigid and thinking that there's only one way to do things, feeling like it makes them superior if they know that one only way to do things. And that's actually something I feel bad for. So, I mean, that's a hard mindset to live with, but I feel so strongly that you guys deserve to see more. And I think it is becoming more common or more accepted on YouTube and online you deserve to see more of not just that perfect pretty picture that someone curated and then edited and put on Instagram. Like life's messy, creativity's messy, um, shipping orders on Etsy can be messy, dyeing fiber is almost always messy. So you deserve to see that things don't always go to plan. It's a mindset to be able to embrace the learning process for what it is and to accept that even if it's a mistake, as long as you don't quit, it's really just a step on your success journey and you will get to success. That's a step that you needed to take in order to be great at it. And Carrie is the one who brought up in our lives, the Brian K. Vaughn said it, and if you wanna be great, first you have to be brave. And it's, I put it on a t-shirt in my Etsy shop because I think that we need to remember that if you quit, you did fail. But if you keep going and you get to the point where you're great at something or you've gotten where you wanna be, which is the same as great, that mistake that you made a year ago, two years ago or whatever is now just one more step where you learn something you definitely needed to learn on your success journey. You guys don't know, I don't know why, as soon as I tell you I appreciate you, I start to tear up every single time. 
but I appreciate you so much. I'm so thankful for all of you. You're just wonderful. You guys mean so much to me. You've changed my life actually. And I am just really grateful and thankful. So I hope that you are having a wonderful November so far and I will see you guys Friday for the Dorset Down installment of Sock Stravaganza, the Breed Study Sock Extension. Thought you guys might wanna see what I've spun so far. Isn't that so pretty? Thanks, I love you, bye.